Surrender, mutant. Of course. Not. Hey, welcome back to Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy. X-Men the Animated Series is one of the most important cartoons of all time, and in today's video we're going to explain what made this show so great and how it almost never happened. And I am so happy that this show is being revived, and I really, really hope they capture the magic of the original. And this is what we want to talk about today, the magic of the X-Men cartoon. Tell Cyclops I made him a convertible. We're going to talk about what made this show so special and how it still holds up today despite being very much a product of its time. And we're also going to talk about the magic of how the show was made because the creators had to face countless challenges to bring this rendition of the X-Men to life. The success of the animated series is the reason why Fox made the first X-Men movie. And that led to the creation of the MCU. And we're actually going to explain how that happened. So let's get into it. Here's why the X-Men animated series is great and why it's the best X-Men adaptation of all time. And before we get rolling, we have designed new X-Men parody merch at our merch store and you are going to love these. We have the X-Men Nighthawks drawn by comic book artist Mark Spears, the X-Fist Club parody of The Breakfast Club, and of course, Doug is Wolverine. And right now, for just one week, all this merch is 15% off. Shopping our merch store is the best way to directly support our channel, and thank you guys so much for watching. I'm one of you, one of the X-Men, and it means more to me than anything in the world. Yeah, that's what it means to me too. All right, so back in the 80s, the X-Men comics reached the height of their popularity after telling some of Marvel's most adult and complicated stories. This amazing run is the reason why the animated series was created. The cartoon introduced an entire generation to the X-Men, especially kids who didn't read comics. The X-Men were huge thanks to this show, and this version of the team became definitive. Yes, the movies played a huge role as well, and we have to mention X-Men Evolution, which was another great show. So what made the show so good then? Well, the show's creators understood the source material very well. They were able to faithfully adapt the stories and characters. In some cases, the show even improved on the original stories, not to mention the iconic opening song so frickin' good. What set the X-Men apart from many other cartoons at the time was the kind of themes the show dealt with. While it was a Saturday morning cartoon, the show tackled some really dark and heavy adult stories, and this show did not shy away from any of it. X-Men used mutants as an allegory to explore racism, prejudice, slavery, wrongful imprisonment, pandemics, depression, grief, war, and so much more. This was a kid's show? Yeah, this show was no joke, man. Why do you hate us? What did we ever do to you? You were born. And that's one of the main things I love about it so much. The show might have been made for kids in the 90s, but re-watching it now as an adult, I've got a whole new appreciation for the stories that the cartoon is telling. And we see this depth right from the start. The opening scene of the first episode starts with Sabretooth going on a rampage, while the media uses this isolated incident to spread fear and hate against all mutants. We then see the reaction of Jubilee's foster parents to the news report. Let's just hope the neighbors never find out our beautiful Jubilee's a mutant. This is a fantastic opening that captures the main themes of the X-Men, showing us why the mutants must hide their abilities, and how racist humans weaponize paranoia to turn this fear into hate. This opening establishes the conflicts the X-Men will have to face in the show. It's not a simple story about good mutants versus bad mutants. It's about the X-Men having to overcome fear and hate. So the X-Men have to deal with all that, change the public's perception, and show the world that this does not represent all mutants. I am alignment for the county, and I drive- Oh my god, stop, what are you doing? Ah, uh, you know, I'm busking. I'm singing for money to entertain all of your customers. But you are our customers. Well, not anymore because I am broke and unemployed. Well then, you should learn programming and back-end website development. According to Stack Overflow, the median salary for back-end developers in the U.S. in 2023 was over $100,000 a year. Nah, but I don't know anything about computers. That's okay. You can actually learn programming from Boot.dev. They're our partner for this video. Boot.dev is essentially a programming RPG where you can earn XP, complete quests, and compete in global leaderboards. You see, Boot.dev understands, guys, that the best way to learn coding is to make sure that you are never bored, so they make learning fun and competitive. Well, I do love games, and these hands can't really play this guitar. The platform gets your hands on the keyboard and gets you writing a ton of code right away. So, if you ever wanted to learn coding, this is by far the best way to start, because you learn by doing. And the Boot.dev Discord community is active and there for you if you ever get stuck. Also, if you're ever completely stuck or you just want to see how the instructor wrote the code, there are solutions available for every challenge on the site. So, click our link in the description box and use our code 
code to get 25% off your first payment of boot.dev. That's 25% off your first month or your first year, depending on the subscription that you choose. Yeah, that boot.dev sounds like a pretty good deal. Thanks. It is. Now, back to what I was saying. Throughout the first episode, we experience what it means to be a mutant through the eyes of Jubilee, a young girl reflecting the audience's perspective. We see how ostracized the mutants are among human society, how they must hide and keep their abilities a secret. Otherwise, giant evil robots will show up and kidnap them. I used to be a normal kid. It's not my fault. And since most of the X-Men are adults who deal with adult problems, the show did need a character who would resonate with kids. So as Jubilee learns about this world, so do we. And when she's invited to join the X-Men, it's like the audience becoming part of the team as well. And through Jubilee, we meet the X-Men. The team consisted of Cyclops, Wolverine, Rogue, Storm, Beast Gambit, Jean Grey, and Professor X. And this, in my opinion, is one of the most definitive and well-rounded lineups of the X-Men. They're a group of misfits and loners. All of them are trying to find their place in the world. And each of them has a specific weakness to make sure they'll never be happy. Wolverine is a badass, but he can never be with Jean, the woman he loves. Scott is the leader of the team. He's super handsome, but he has to always wear glasses or else he'll eradicate everybody around him. Rogue is beautiful, but she can never touch anyone. You get the point. Some mutants might welcome the chance to become normal. The show never depicts them just as superheroes. The focus is always on them being mutants who are simply trying to make the world a safer place for everyone. There's nuance to the conflicts. Nothing is ever simple. The characters feel like real people dealing with real problems and living their lives. This show takes its time with character development, peeling each X-Man back like a delicious multi-layered onion. Personally, I hate onions. They make me cry. Also, I think I might be allergic to them and they would kill me if I ate them. And these characters, guys, made me cry multiple times and I am not ashamed to admit that. Someday, with work and hope, the world will change. Until then, carry my love with you always. On top of realistic characters with powerful stories, the cartoon shows the audience that there are consequences to everything the X-Men are doing. In the second episode, the X-Men go on a mission to rescue Jubilee, and the X-Men fail. And failure comes at a cost. Beast gets arrested, and he spends most of season one in prison. And it becomes a long-running story arc where Beast must prove his innocence while having to deal with the justice system. That is why I must stand trial. They must see that we are not a threat to mankind, but are a part of it. And Morph, I mean, Morph just freaking gets killed. And it's not a fake out, like Morph is dead for real. What about Morph? Well, he does come back in season two, but the writers originally didn't want to do that. The network forced them to. But as far as season one knew, you know, he was dead and he just never did stuff like that in Saturday morning cartoons. And the pain and guilt of his death haunts the team for the rest of the season. I'll avenge you, my friend. I swear it. And even when Morph returns, his story is so messed up. The show always challenges the X-Men with moral questions about what is the right thing to do. And many times, there was just no simple answers. Every time it looks like Magneto was right and there is just no way humans and mutants could ever share the world, there is always something that gives the X-Men a glimmer of hope for a better future. No matter how bleak things get, the X-Men must never lose hope. And they must fight to bring Xavier's dream into reality. Heroic fools. The brave are always the first to die. And that's what makes this show so special. The show dared to explore a lot of social and political conflicts. It never felt like the show was trying to patronize or dumb down these adult themes to its younger audience. During this time, most shows were very procedural. That means they were standalone episodes that had very little connectivity, especially cartoons. This way, kids could tune in without needing to know what happened in the previous episodes. Even Batman the Animated Series followed this structure. But X-Men broke all these barriers and changed how stories are told in cartoons. Plot lines carried over from one episode to the next. Stories were developed across multiple episodes, building an overarching plot that culminated in the season finale. But at times, stories continued to the next season. There were always connections and callbacks, and this all gave the story so much more weight and importance. This is how the show could tell these dense stories, specifically when the show adapted the Dark Phoenix Saga, which is told across nine episodes in season three. But was it better than the movies? Dude, come on, it's not even close. Come on! Grow those back. And that's what makes the storytelling so special. It felt so different at the time. The creators trusted the audience to follow along. Even when the show explored seriously dark ideas, and even with all the crazy time travel episodes or the aliens or the dinosaurs or the insanity of Mojo World. Never underestimate your audience. They're generally sensitive, intelligent people who respond positively to quality entertainment. Not to mention all the iconic moments that became memes or Wolverine's awesome one-liners. Are you sure this is where they've taken her, Wolverine? 
The nose knows, tough guy. And we gotta talk about that final episode. The ending just hit you right in the feels. It's a bit of a shame the final season had a dip in animation quality, and we'll explain later why exactly that happened. But this ending was just perfect. Magneto is about to make his final stand against humanity, but what stops him is the fact that Xavier, his philosophical rival, the guy who stood in his way for years, is dying. A telepathic message to Lalandra is Xavier's only hope. You may be able to supercharge his mind just like you did mine. He abandons his crusade in anger against humanity, and he just wants to be by his friend in his final moments in his life. And that scene where Xavier says goodbye to the X-Men. I'm grateful to have the chance to say goodbye. That really hits me, and it hits me freaking hard. Of course, Xavier didn't die. As the X-Men stand next to Magneto, watching their mentor go to space with his alien girlfriend, there's a feeling that we've arrived at the end of a beautiful journey. But at the same time, it also feels like the start of something new, and that's the story that X-Men 97 will explore. The last will and testament of Charles Xavier. Everything he built now belongs to me. This show changed the X-Men forever. While the X-Men comics were doing really well at the time, the show made mutants into a household name. And its influence still has an impact three decades later. I mean, there is a reason the MCU uses the iconic music every time they mention a mutant. Like a mutation. They even used the Jim Lee inspired designs of the characters from the show. I mean, this show is unlike anything else at the time. Right about Batman. Sure, Batman the Animated Series was also great, but like on a different kind of level. But Batman had an incredible creative team that was supported by a very big studio that fully believed in the show, and those creators had big budgets to bring their vision to life. X-Men was a Hail Mary shot by a few people who believed in its potential. The story behind the making of this show is insane, so it's a miracle that it even aired, not to mention ran for five whole seasons. So what's the crazy story? What happened? Well, for that, I need to pull out my previously on X-Men, the making of the animated series series book. It was written by one of the show's creators, Eric Luald, and it tells the incredible story behind the creation of this show. But this story starts even before the show is conceived. Because back in the late 80s, there was another attempt to make an X-Men cartoon, and its failure is the reason why we got the 90s show. So Marvel Productions tried to launch an X-Men cartoon with a failed pilot episode called Pride of the X-Men. It originally aired on September 16, 1989. The pilot was about Kitty Pride getting an invitation to join the X-Men. So Kitty kind of had a similar role to Jubilee, although it lacked any nuance. This rendition of the X-Men team stopped Magneto from blowing up the world with a comet or something like that. Also in this episode, they gave Wolverine an Australian accent. Welcome her. Wait, she's not joining the X-Men, is she? She's just a kid. Why would they do that? Well, Wolverine was Australian because Crocodile Dundee happened to be a really big movie around that time. On top of that, Wolverine had an Australian accent in Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends, so I guess it was canon or something? Want a piece of fruit? Yeah, like an Australian could ever be Wolverine. Go f*** yourself. And fortunately, this pilot never got picked up. Why, was it really bad? Well, it wasn't an absolute disaster, but this take on the X-Men was devoid of all the things that make the 90s show so good. It was very much like so many other cartoons that were on at the time. So, Pride of the X-Men had to die so the X-Men animated series could live. Despite the failure of the Pride of the X-Men, the TV executive Margaret Loesch saw the potential of the X-Men, and she was committed to adapting the comics to the small screen. After becoming the head of Fox Kids, Loesch convinced the higher-ups at Fox to greenlight X-Men the Animated Series. She had so much faith in the show that she actually put her job on the line. Eric Luald was hired as the executive producer, and he worked with a creative team that included his wife Jill Luald, Will Mugino, and Larry Houston, who directed every single episode of the show. The design of X-Men the Animated Series was influenced by Jim Lee's early 90s X-Men run. These X-Men costumes are iconic, but they almost had to change all of the costumes after Jim Lee left Marvel Comics. However, things were almost very different. In the early stages of development, Stan Lee championed the show to adapt his and Jack Kirby's first class story from the 60s, and he wanted a more kid-friendly cartoon. Also, they had this problem of how they can introduce so many characters each episode, so Lee insisted on the idea that he get to narrate the show, just like he did for previous Marvel cartoons, including the failed Pride of the X-Men. Meanwhile, unaware of Magneto's attack on the headquarters, the X-Men race to the Deep Space Observatory. Lee's plan was for him to to open and close every show at a desk like Walt Disney. But luckily, the show's creators held their ground and went for something else. Zip it, Stan Lee! They explained that the X-Men needed an adult tone that would do justice to the comics, and it would also set the show apart from any other cartoon at the time. 
Originally, Kitty Pride was supposed to be in the show, but she was replaced with Jubilee. Why? Well, after the failure of Pride of the X-Men, Marvel wanted to distance themselves from Kitty. Apparently, they believe that Kitty was bad luck or something since she's one of the only major X-Men characters from the comics who never appears in the show. That sucks, but what doesn't is the amazing opening song. the most iconic intro theme ever. Now the music was composed by Ron Wasserman, and that guy knows how to make iconic intros because he also composed the Go Go Power Rangers theme song for Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Go, go, Power Rangers. And I also have to mention the Japanese version of the intro, which kind of goes hard. The first episode premiered on October 31st, 1992, just about a month after Batman the Animated Series first aired. Two of the best animated shows premiering just a month apart. My, we 90s kids were blessed. However, X-Men was supposed to air earlier, but production problems delayed the first episode. And this is one of the biggest obstacles the show faced, a really troublesome production. Yeah, what happened? Well, you see, Margaret Loesch brought Saban Entertainment in to produce the show, but Saban didn't have enough resources to actually handle the show. So they outsourced the workload to a smaller animation studio called Graz Entertainment, who then outsourced to a smaller South Korean animation studio who ended up making a bunch of mistakes that they refused to fix, leading to Fox threatening them with a lawsuit. Not great, Bob. In fact, the third episode almost aired before the two-part premiere because of these problems. On top of that, the show had to deal with endless budget cuts and studio interference. The network kept pushing for a more kid-friendly tone and even product placements to boost toy sales. Even with the show becoming a massive hit, those problems continued to plague it throughout its entire lifetime. In fact, here's a fun anecdote about Lady Deathstrike when she premieres in season three. They hired a new animation studio, which was very gung-ho to prove itself. So they actually drew her with like massive cleavage, even though they were told not to do that. Oh, tits! Tits! Bubbies, bubbies, bubbies. Oh. They then had a crisis because they had to redraw every single frame because it's a kid's show. So that's why in that episode, Lady Deathstrike now has a white t-shirt on underneath her outfit. And whenever you see her up close, she is redrawn to be completely flat chested. So all of these problems are why those final episodes have a serious drop in quality. Saban, which is a notoriously cheap company, had greater creative control and so they outsourced it to a cheaper studio. So what happened? They ran out of money? Uh, something like that. You see, originally the show was supposed to end in season four with the four-parter Beyond Good and Evil. However, Fox ordered more episodes at the very last minute. In fact, the final episode of season four was going to set up an entirely new team of X-Men, but then because they ordered to have season five, they had to rewrite the ending. But by that point, Graz Entertainment went bankrupt. So the final six episodes were done by Saban on the cheap which is why the animation style is so different and clearly lower quality in those final episodes. I mean, not to mention that all the characters suddenly look completely different. Now, all of these problems made the creator's jobs nearly impossible, but you would never even know it when you were watching the show, which goes to prove that nothing beats good storytelling and creativity. X-Men was a massive success, and it is still one of the most beloved X-Men adaptations of all time. The show's popularity is actually one of the main reasons why 20th Century Fox made the first X-Men movie. In 1994, producer Lauren Schuller Donner bought the rights to the X-Men comics after Marvel Comics went bankrupt. And by the way, she is the wife of Richard Donner, who directed the first two Superman movies. The success of the animated series proved to Donner that the X-Men have the potential to be on the big screen. And this is how we got the first X-Men movie in 2000. You actually go outside in these things? What would you prefer? Yellow spandex? And who knows where the superhero genre would be without those early X-Men movies. I don't know, person. I kind of like the Spider-Man movie more. But that first X-Men movie was the big break for a certain associate producer, one Kevin Feige. And that is how he got his first job working on a superhero movie, the very first X-Men. Oh, that's the MCU guy. That's right. At the time, Feige worked under Donner. He was assigned as an associate producer on the first X-Men movie because of his knowledge of the comics. Feige impressed the executive so much that he ended up working on almost every Marvel movie in the early 2000s, including the original three X-Men films and the Spider-Man trilogy. And eventually, Feige was able to produce his first MCU movie, a little old film called Iron Man. So, the 90s X-Men show is the reason why we got the X-Men movie franchise, and those X-Men movies are pretty much the reason why we've got the MCU. And it's all coming full circle now, since those movies are now, ironically, going to save the MCU in Deadpool and Wolverine. I am Marvel Jesus. The X-Men animated series will live on, of course, with the upcoming X-Men 97. This revival will continue the story of the 90s show, bringing back many of the original voice cast. But not Jean Grey, because she's a politician who actually served in Canadian Parliament. To me, my X-Men. 
So this is why I love X-Men the Animated Series. It's one of our all-time favorite shows. And I really hope that the revival will make kids go back and watch the original because it needs to be cherished and we need more shows like that. In fact, we have a recap up on the channel right now where we go through every single episode of the original X-Men series, so make sure you check that out. Big shout out to the writer and editor of this video, Mr. Pavel T. You can find his links below. So what do you guys think about the X-Men from the 90s? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.